and wow. um, uh, my most of my most of my well, my sister's family and all all there. So, I was thinking that I'd tell you about some things that I've been thinking about. Okay, and you you can give me a reality check and tell you tell me what you think. So, one of the things that I've noticed recently. So I've I so we, okay. So let's take a step back. So for a long time, I wrote you know a manual for creating atheists, and I was trying to make the world more sane and more rational, and I was trying to help people become more thoughtful and reflect on their beliefs, have reliable epistemologies upon which they could rely. And one of the things that I noticed since maybe 2013, maybe 2012 was that as religiosity decreased, deranged woke beliefs increased. And I guess my first question to you is, uh, I, I don't know who came up with this, I might've come up with this, I don't know who came up with this, but the substitution hypothesis. Yes. So, so do you think, and I honestly do not know the answer to this question, do you think that as one religion fades another like default is the belief state for humans they just have to believe something and and as one as the old religion fades a new one has to come in yeah gullibility expands to fill the vacuum exactly or something. yeah precisely I, I i suppose that's right i hadn't really thought of it before but um it sounds plausible to me um i think gk chesterton who was a very religious man right. Um, said when people stop believing in God, they they believe in anything. Yeah. Um, and um, he was a very witty, clever man, although he was a devout Roman Catholic. Yeah. Um, there's something in it, I think, and there's no doubt about it that um, we are having, we seem to have exchanged one form of superstitious religiosity for another. Yeah. And the analogy goes pretty deep. Um, I think um, John McWhorter pointed out that there's a strong relationship between original sin in the Christian religion. Oh, that was me pointed that out. 2014. You out, yeah, yeah. Okay, that well, was my article with James Lindsay. Privilege is the original sin, but yeah, go ahead. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, original sin being, we're all born in sin. We, we all inherit right. the sin of Adam. Right. And we white people inherit the sin of slavery right. and colonialism. And because we're white, we have to feel guilty for what our, not necessarily our ancestors, but people of the same color as us yeah. in past centuries did. So that's, that's one analogy. And then um, the level well, transubstantiation, right. uh, which is in the Catholic religion, you know, um, the, the wine literally turns to right. blood, where literally doesn't quite mean literally. It means what Aristotle called the accidental stay wine but the but the true substance of the wine becomes blood oh. so when somebody stands up and says i am a woman although they've got a, a male body right that's transubstantiation um in the accidentals they still have a penis and they still have y chromosome but in the true substance um they have become um they have become female um so trans sub well that's where the word transubstantiation comes from the yeah. transubstance yeah and um there's a very strong analogy to transubstantiation in transsexualism oh uh tell, tell me more how so well um the the wine becomes blood and the when the priest simply declares it that, that it is and a male person becomes female when he declares himself to be female. Uh, and um, in the Aristotelian terms, the substance has changed. Right. The substance of wine has changed to, to blood. The substance of maleness has changed to femaleness. But the accidentals, the incidentals, uh, are, are, are what are regarded by Catholics as trivial and by trans people as trivial. So they, they really believe that they have become the other sex. It's remarkable how obvious it is that those are delusions. I mean, it's crystal clear 
to anybody not caught in the orbit of the ideology that that is a delusion. Yes. Um, they get around it by this word gender, which, which oh. is separate from yeah. sex. And there, there are some who, who I think even think their sex has changed. Correct. And others who think that they admit that their sex hasn't changed, but their gender has. Um, yeah. So I guess I have two questions. One is, it seems to me that there are degrees of delusion that one can have. So if we accept that, like there are certain things that are, like if I told you everybody, you know, those books are really aliens from another planet and they've come out, okay, that's another level of delusion. And so I often think, this is the thing that, that's been causing me to think about this. I'm utterly incredulous at the sheer madness that people believe now in a way that I was not incredulous you, you know, in 2010 or 2001. So, it, so, so let's take a look at s somebody walked on water. This guy named Jesus, he walked on water. It, you know, this is a in intervention in the space co time continuum by a supernatural being and it caused this individual to walk on water. Okay, that's clearly a delusion. If somebody believes in it, if someone accepts that as true. And then you have the belief that men can get pregnant. That, to me, seems like a significantly more profound delusion. Yes. Or, or am I wrong? Well, I think it doesn't it come from the postmodern belief that feelings are more important than facts. Yeah, standpoint Something, epistemology. Yes. Yeah, and it comes. I guess they they could just say that it it's the redefinition of the word. But they actually, like, they literally believe men can get pregnant. And the thing that I've been thinking about is, kind of goes back to Plato. Is it better to let people believe benign delusions? I mean, in an ideal world, people, wouldn't believe, people would proportion their confidence in the belief to the evidence they have for the belief. But humanity is sloppy and messy. And the thing that I've been thinking about recently is, if it's true that there are degrees of delusion and if it's true, and I don't know if it's true that there's a substitution hypothesis, then should rational people um, step out of the way or not encourage people to believe things that are false? Because I would never do that. And I think that's grossly unethical. But um, there are certain delusions that are better for people to believe in mass than others. Yes, yeah, so if you've got to believe in a delusion, if, if there's something, some law that says you, there's a certain quotient of deludedness that everybody's got to have. Right. And certain, some, <laughs> some are more harmless than others. And correct, so, and correct. So, I mean, I, I, th I sort of feel this a little bit about Islam and Christianity, yeah. that, that um, um, Islam is, is such an evil at the, at the moment, or yeah. Islamism is such an evil at the moment, that in Africa especially, Maybe Christianity is a better alternative, and right. it may be that it's no good trying to pre pre preach atheism in Africa. Right. Um, and Christianity might be a better, a better alternative. I think Ayan Hersiali has suggested something yeah, similar she, to that. Yeah, she, she has. I think the last one of the last times I saw you, I did a talk in Kamloops, Canada. Yes. And uh, it was uh, about deprogramming jihadis. Yes. And one of the things that they do when they deprogram jihadis is they don't use atheism or Christianity. They use more benign interpretations of the Quran. And so I've just been wondering in terms of this. The, the, so, so I no longer think it's true. I used to think it's true. If people just stop believing this silliness, all of a sudden we'd have a flourishing of rational human beings that engaged each other and proportion their beliefs to the evidence. But the last decade has shown that that's, monstrously false. In fact, the last decade has shown that we now have wide-scale institutional capture of our institutions, particularly our academic institutions. Uh, I'm specifically referring to the United States, but I'm also referring to here. We, we went to Goldsmiths and did some videos the other day in places where the ideology has seeped in. And I've been thinking about, like, how do you create a prophylactic to prevent an institution 
from succumbing to what's morally fashionable, you know, to, to, to succumbing to the new religion. So you're on the board of the University of Austin. I'm a founding faculty at the University of Austin. Today, the issues are free speech and open inquiry, which are under attack. But maybe tomorrow it's something that we can't even think about, right? Maybe we, I mean, who knows what it's going to be. So is there a way that you can, you know, subspecie eternitatis, or is there a way that you can, I don't know what it would be like, write something into the mission statement, or what can you do to prevent the dominoes, the an ideology from having a domino effect and just taking over whole-scale institutions. Well, if you're right about the substitution hypothesis, that's yeah. a very pessimistic conclusion. Yeah. Um, I don't my, know that I am. No, my, my, yeah. my whole life has been devoted to the idea that you, you simply argue in favor of evidence-based beliefs. Right. And uh, um, I suppose I'd take a rather sort of take it or leave it attitude. I mean, th yeah. th this, is, this is what the evidence shows. Yeah. Why don't you believe it? Um, but if you're right about the substitution hypothesis, then I'm rather inclined to give up. I mean, I, I don't know how to cope with that. Um, I used to think that the one thing that would make me want to die would be if I found myself in a world where I was surrounded by people who no longer believed in evidence and believed in something else other than evidence, somehow felt contempt for evidence. And mm. I hope we're not approaching that now. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't I mean, none of yeah. my friends are like that. Yeah, I was thinking about that, like, uh, talking about death as I get older, I've been thinking about my own death. But I wouldn't want someone to be kind to me on my deathbed because they thought that if they weren't kind to me, they were going to go to hell. I would want someone to be kind to me because they wanted to be kind to yes. me, right? Yes. And so I, even this idea that there's this place where people burn or something, like, I want people to be motivated not by something external to themselves, like a reward for being nice. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, so this is what, okay. So this is one of the things that, that I've learned from thinking about this stuff for, I don't know, over a quarter century. And I'd love to hear what you think about it. I think, so, so we go around the country, we go around the world, we now go around the world and we set these lines up. Uh, there are lines of tape on sidewalks. I don't know if you've seen me do this or not. And uh, strongly disagree, disagree, slightly disagree, neutral. Uh, it's like this tablecloth here. Uh, slightly agree, agree, strongly agree. And then we'll ask people a question like, should there be, uh, trans women should be in women's sports or uh, whatever, whatever it is. And one of the things that I've learned, and then we say three, five, four, three, two, one, go, and they walk to a line. And then I do street epistemology on them. I ask them, why they believe it, what it would take them to change their mind. Sometimes people change, sometimes people don't. But here's what I've learned about this. And here's what I've learned, a, a key lesson in, in my intellectual life from the, the, the New Atheist Movement and from speaking to literally tens of thousands of people in prisons, everything, is that people will go to a line not based upon the evidence they have for the line, but they'll go to the line because they think that's the line that they should be standing on that makes them a good person. Yes, uh, and um, it, it may be the line that is compatible with the their political Correct. tribe, Correct. Or religious tribe. Right. Um, I think Steven Pinker, in his latest book, has evidence that when we make our political judgment, we, I mean humanity in, in general, yeah. it tends to be not based on evidence, but tends to be based upon tribal loyalty. Mm. And that's a very depressing conclusion. And by the way, um, one of the things that's been depressing me about my, my being sort of anti-woke and, and, yeah. and anti the militant um, trans lobby is that people think I must be right wing. And I'm never, I've never been right wing. I've voted <laughs> left all my life. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I detest Donald Trump, for example. Right. But there are people out there on Twitter, especially, who think right. that because I detest Donald Trump, therefore I must be a, an apologist for trans wokeism or, or vice versa. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. I think I think that that is an intentional tactic uh, of people. I think that that is what woke people use. People who are 
have fallen to the, have, been, have had their uh, cognitions hijacked to this ideology. And I think it's very easy to write you off entirely if they say, oh, Richard Dawkins, he, he's just a right-wing extremist. Mm -hmm. You know, Pinker, he's a right-wing extremist, although he's the second largest don donor to the Democrats and Hillary Clinton and Harvard, or wh wh whoever it is. I've never voted for a Republican candidate in my whole life. I'm constantly getting that I'm on the right. But I think it's a tactic both because they don't have to do the intellectual work to rebut the arguments, so they can just a priori say that's not true, and it's a tactic because the left-wing media won't have me on, for example. So the left-wing media won't, it has a kind of allergy to any self-criticism. So then I'll go on the, on the right, uh, right, right-wing media, and the people on the left will say, well, look, Bogosian's a right-winger. Well, no, I'm I'm only going on the right because I'm more than happy. Rachel Maddow has, and nobody's ever invited me. I've actually invited myself, and they won't have me. So I think it's a kind of strategy to not do the intellectual work to rebut the position because it's hard to it's hard to rebut the position. So you know, we've been talking about the the trans thing, um, and the main problem. Well, yeah, I think it is the main problem I have is I don't think children under 18 can consent to, uh, you know, Luprin or surgery or it, what Abigail Schreier calls irreversible damage. And I just spoke to Helen Joyce about this. Um, uh, uh, um, she's from England. She's from, originally from I've Ireland. I've read her book. Yeah, she's her, her, her trans. is great. And I just spoke to her about this. Um, so one of the things that she said in that interview that, I was like, wow, I, like, I just literally never thought of it before. She said, so, so I, I always took the figure of 0.06, that 0.06% of the people were legitimately trans, and anything above that is a social contagion, right? It's kind of, but she said, no, that's not true. The whole thing is a culture-bound syndrome, like all of it. And, and I just, it really gave me pause, and I thought, well, I thought the the idea was that there was something operative in people's brains, you know, the whole born in the wrong body. And she said, no, it's just it's not true. I see. Well, I long ago, um, when it came out, I read um, Elaine, sorry, um, Jan, Jan, Jan Morris. Oh, Jan Morris, yeah, yeah. Jan Morris's book, Conundrum, where she, yeah. was, she was a uh, journalist and she was, one, she was the only journalist, I think, on the original expedition that climbed Everest. Yeah. She didn't climb Everest, but... but in those days, um, James Morris was, was, was the journalist. And then um, she wrote this book explaining how she really did feel that she was a woman trapped in a man's body. And I was sympathetic to that. It seemed to me to be well argued. Uh, she's a very good writer. Uh, and she went through a tremendous ordeal. I mean, she was hormone treatment and yeah, yeah. surgery and things as an adult. I think she had a sort of journey of about 10 years or maybe even longer. Um, so I sort of feel you have to respect somebody who sacrifices so much for yeah. that belief. Whereas people who just suddenly say, I think I'll be a man or woman. Especially after they see the inside of the court and they've been sentenced as guilty. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, or, or that six foot two inch swimmer who, who no, Leah over. Thomas yeah, yeah I mean. and she had she was intact so Leah Thomas had her penis and my understanding is when she Leah Thomas I don't even know the pronouns but when Leah Thomas was in the shower there's the there it was dangling out and so th there is something about uh so, so you want to be compassionate you want to be sympathetic in a liberal society you want to let people live the kind of lives they they want to live and have all the rights they want to have but but that said, that there does seem there, there do seem to be some, like Kathleen Stock, I was talking to her today. You know, uh, women's only spaces. There, there is something. There's a prudence and a wisdom in that. And to me, it's never been about people who are. I don't know. Want to say actually trans because I don't even know what that means, but. It's that people can claim to be trans to access women's only spaces to abuse or women to, or to get. Swimming records. Yeah, to break records. To break, to break records and become a swimming champion. Oh. Um, yes, but, but there are people, they may be deluded, but at least they've been through hell to get there. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, and as adults too, not, not seduced as children by, yeah. by 
doctors. Who... So that's the moral thing, right? So this is the thing that, that I'm thinking about, about the trans issue. So somebody who is adamant and, and so, you know, trans women are women, trans is it period, trans women are women. And, and from that, it follows that they should be able to compete alongside natal women in sporting events. What I do not think is happening is the belief was formed on any, you know, rigorous epistemology, evidence-based epistemology. Like, in other words, I don't think that they did a careful examination of the evidence and concluded that either the differences were trivial or there were no differences. I think that they formed the belief that trans women, and I always have to, I, I translate the word trans in my head as fake because I get mixed up by the words, that tr trans women, natal men should participate in women's sports on moral grounds. So there's no evidence that you can get, it's like the line thing where you stand yeah. on the line. There's no evidence that you can give them a tensile strength or cardio value, whatever, whatever the evidence would be, because the moral uh, intuition or the moral sentiment would override any consideration of evidence. So then how do you, you're talking about a competing battle of morals. And I guess that kind of gets back to the substitution hypothesis. Like, wouldn't we rather have people in society? Okay, again, we would rather nobody have any delusions. But if it is the case that people are going to, that delusion is the default, then I don't, I don't want to say we should nudge them to benign delusions, but it would be certainly better for everybody if they had more benign delusions. Yes. I, I hope the substitution hypothesis is wrong. Yeah. I, I, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's right, I've kind of wasted my life, really, because I'm, I, I've been simply trying to persuade people to be influenced by evidence. And if, if, that's, uh, if that's a losing, if that's a lost battle. I don't think it is. I, uh, but here, so let me throw this out to you. Do you think the best way to persuade people to be influenced by evidence is that, it's a, is that, that, make, that act itself makes them a better person? So in other words, could you use a moral argument to persuade somebody to be influenced by evidence because what seems to not work is, and I think our, our friend Sam Harris has said this, that the, um, there's no evidence that you can give someone to persuade them to formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence. So well, maybe you have a yeah. different tack. Yes, I, it would never occur to me to try to use a moral argument. I mean, I think my, I would prefer to go for science and say science is wonderful. Mm. And science is um, poetic. Science is something that you really can devote your life to and feel fulfilled. And As you have. Well, yes, and so me, me, plenty of other people have. I mean, yeah. any, any scientist would probably say something like that. And really, it, the, the strides that humanity has made in science, in evidence-based reality-based right. view of the world is staggeringly impressive. We have made no strides through self-delusion. No. No delusions have no. cured cancer, given us the CPU, sent us a rocket ship to Mars. That's right. I mean, and that, those are all sort of practical things, but also just understanding the size and shape and scope of the universe and right. time and space and and the, the origin of all things and evolution. Uh, it's just amazing what a privilege it is to to live in a world after Newton and Darwin and 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 Max Planck um, and and to understand the universe in which you live and that's a wonderful I almost say spiritual experience and it's so wow. much grander and so much bigger and so much more worthy worthwhile than petty little concerns yeah, you, you'll get no argument from me. So I guess just my question to you, um, let's say that you make that argument to somebody. Let's say that you make that argument to an administrator at an institution or in, at an institutional level. And it's a lovely argument. It's well articulated. It resonates with some people. And I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm telling you, one thing I have in my mind is when, when I was a teaching, I tried to get a science and pseudoscience class in the 
um, in the K through 12 system. And there was a single slide that my team had put on and it was about homeopathy. And, um, and they gave the presentation at two uh, uh, high schools and both administrators from the high school said, oh, you can't, you can't put that in there. The slide basically said, there's just no evidence for this. It didn't say, you know, it, it was, it was, it, it phrased it in the most polite way possible. Like this is not evidence. Don't do this. And when my, the people from my team asked why, they said, well, people will be offended by that. Oh, people will be offended. We don't want to, we don't want to offend the parents who use homeopathy. But my, my point to you was that, so, so, Let's say that we want people to discover a love for science and a passion for evidence-based epistemology. Um, I know this is a weird question, but if you cannot persuade them by evidence and wonder at the universe and the instrumental use of technology for human beings, whether it's you know curing cancer or what have you, do you think that the moral argument is the way to go to persuade them? Well, I haven't quite grasped what you would mean by moral argument. Like, um, um, you should do good. Pe good people formulate your beliefs on the basis of evidence. If you formulate your beliefs on the basis of evidence, you are more likely to construct something outside yourself to bring about your flourishing and your own community's flourishing. Formulating your beliefs. Therefore, for something like a quick syllogism, formulating your beliefs on the basis of evidence is the moral thing to do. Because if you formulate it on the basis of non-evidence, you might end up planting a bomb Correct. to kill infidels. Correct. Yes. Well, yeah. So, so